uh, is there any uh, uh, witnesses that wish to provide uh, a, a, your uh, written comment card or oral testimony on for or against um, uh, Mrs. Tucker? Uh, if you would provide those cards, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, uh, what I would like to do uh, is again uh, go through a series of questions with you, if I may, Mrs. Tucker. But I, I, I know you've got finance. Don't know if you're. Well, I just I don't want to just I don't want to dominate the conversation first every time. So I, if members, Senator Schwartner, as a guest, is there? No, you're no, that's okay. But I don't know what your other obligations are. And I know you're okay. I just want to make sure that. If I go first again, uh, I'm not being discourteous to uh, fellow senators. So. Um, you heard previous questions uh, with, uh, with Mr. Hicks. I would ask you the same thing about tuition and its increases, and uh, particularly with what uh, Senator Schwartner had, had uh, recognized. Great concern on many Texans' part about what it's costing to go to college, the debt they're incurring, rap rates of increase. Uh, what would be your plan to reduce tuition and keep it tethered to inflation uh, so that it's more affordable? You know, Senator, one of the things that... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my, would you please state your name for the record? Oh. Uh, yes, I am Sarah Tucker. Thank you. All Thank right. you, um, I think when I retired from my corporate life, I decided to dedicate myself to advancing higher education for disadvantaged students. I was stunned at the difference in what it cost a student in the 90s versus what I paid. And um, I know we've talked about the uh, tethering of late, but since 1970, the cost of a public education, higher education in the United States has been at twice the level of inflation. When I ran my scholarship organization, when I first took over, a thousand dollar scholarship would go a long way in helping a low income kid cover the total cost of attendance. I quickly realized um, that even taking it up to twenty-five hundred dollars, our students were getting less and less buying power. Um, Regent Hicks earlier talked about the way campuses have um, grown organically. And one of the things that I've observed um, is the absence of benchmarking. And one of the things that I would hope to introduce, if, if confirmed, is there are some campuses across the United States, there are some systems across the United States that have done a phenomenal job in, in understanding what the true cost of delivering an education is and what compact they can have with families so the families can plan over the duration of their students attending that school versus having to get a bill that says, if you want your child to stay for year two, then it's going to be this versus this, no questions asked. And so one of the things that I would hope to do is that outside benchmarking to understand how other campuses have been able to guarantee um, tuition and student fees, because sometimes tuition stays flat but student fees go up. So you have to look at the total cost of attendance. The second thing is, I think we've suffered, um, I know in, in my corporate life, more often I was asked to do a zero-based budget versus just assume what you had last year and then add cost of inflation to it. And so the other thing I, I would be interested in is how many of us um, at many of our institutions, whether they are health science centers, medical schools, or, or um, academic institutions, truly do um, zero-based budgeting. Um, too often I find that they look at big lines and say, well, since that's a big 10% here to protect all these other lines, I think the taxpayers of Texas deserve a hard look at how we're spending our money. So bench, outside benchmarking, zero-based budgeting, and then tethering ourselves to understand the affordability for all of our students, not just a select few. I very, I, well, I didn't ask the, the zero-based budgeting question, but I, I very much appreciate that answer because it's one of the things we're trying to get the other state agencies can work toward so that there's not just a standard expectation that things always rise. Because um, the economy doesn't always rise. We, we like it too. We want to make sure that we provide as few encumbrances to it continuing to rise as possible. But you can't create that expectation. Um, and then if you, if you don't go to a zero-based budgeting system, but you always go to, um, to a, a, a previous base, assuming rise, you institutionally or structurally take away any view at the necessity or need. You don't look hard at that particular segment of the budget to see where you can make reductions or if it's like what we do with Sunset where we look at uh, review analysis <coughs> and the like. So I, I'd be very interested to have 
uh, somebody on the Board of Regents with that perspective that, that's looking at zero-based budgeting to ensure you get that sort of transparency that you Senator Watson and I very much appreciate um, to, to get where we can find efficiencies to lower, not just keeping tuition at inflation, but maybe reduce it because we've gotten rid of some, some areas that uh, we don't need to keep compensating or, or charging students for. Um, I would ask about that transparency as well in the sense of, of tuition and fees, because you mentioned fees. Uh, what thoughts do you have on how to make tuition and fees transparent as to, as to how they're being used? Given that, what is it, 15% of the, the university system's budget comes from the taxpayers, some comes from organized, <coughs> some comes from, from uh, uh, private donations, charities, maybe even you know, athletics, other things, making sure that the respective resources that fund the university's operations were transparent to the taxpayer for their portion of alumni for their point. How would you do that? How would you make things more transparent for the types of dollars that you receive? Um, Senator Burwell, I will tell you, I was stunned when I served our country and learned that my federal student aid budget was $100 billion. <coughs> um, and I didn't, I couldn't get my hands around graduation rates because the formula, as Regent Hicks alluded, only counts one thing, first time, full time freshman. And every time I tried to ask the campus, how is it that you're getting X? And this is the graduation rate out here. Well, you're not counting my transfer students. You're not counting my students that go elsewhere. It's really better than this. And I think American taxpayers, I think the citizens of Texas, should look at institutions and understand for students that have circumstances like my son or like my daughter, what will the total cost of attendance be? What kind of employment placement will they have? What kind of income will they have? And we as a state um, need to start collecting that information and, and having our citizens have access to that information. I don't want to buy something that I'm not going to get a return on investment in. Senator Taylor mentioned earlier students that come in, take on debt, and then leave. Um, I was raised to believe that a college education was the way to a better life. I was fortunate that I was able to get through um, in three and a half years, even though I was working three jobs. The times have changed, as Regent Hicks said. And um, I know I would have appreciated understanding what I was investing in and the return I was going to get. Um, one of the things that uh uh, spoke with Regent Hicks about as well was our formula funding models that have generally been on rewarding the number of students present, not rewarding the accomplishments. So you reward activity, not reward accomplishment. Now you have to have activity to get to accomplishment, but activity isn't the same as, as you know. Um, and TSTC is, is doing some things, and some of the other university systems. Are there areas where uh, maybe at certain colleges or certain portions of colleges that you could look at or would you be willing to look at with great rigor the ability of, of the Board of Regents to start making some decisions on funding based upon outcomes and accomplishment that are measurable, that are productive to the state of Texas, i.e. we produce this graduate in this amount of time that is now in the Texas economy making this amount of uh, uh, income Therefore, you're compensated for that accomplishment as opposed to just simply the presence in the university. Your thoughts on, on that having, type of compensation? Having been raised in the private sector, um, I was always groomed to think it's not inputs, it's outcomes that, that get compensated, and it's what gets measured, gets managed, what gets rewarded, gets repeated. Um, I, I share those uh, region, region Hicks um, sentiment. We've got nine different types of academic institutions, and we've got, we can't have a one-size-fits-all. I think, ultimately, much as Regent Hicks said, we have to have a combination of the two. You know, what is some base funding that can support you in educating that student while that student? What are progress rates that we'd like to see, and then what are outcomes? And what can be earned if you do a better job by the students that you're educating? Um, I know that you're, you're not a current serving region, um, the, some elements of the Crow Report I do want to go over with you because I think it's it's paramount and it is our duty to ensure uh, the trust that will be placed in you should it be confirmed um, that uh, we have a direct conversation about that. Um, the comments that were made in the Crow Report about maintaining good relationships and in, in locations, your primary customer. Who is your primary customer, both individually as a region, collectively as a member of the Board of Regents, that with whom you must maintain that good relationship? Taxpayer. The 
taxpayer and is, 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 is I've got to represent the views. I, I said I, I serve on private um, public company boards, and I know that while I was asked to be there for my experience, it's the shareholder who I've got to keep utmost or top of mind as, as I inform, as I ask questions, as I bore down into the company's ability. Um, if the citizens of Texas entrust me with this, and if confirmed, I have to make sure that anything I do in, in my behavior as a region, what's the needs of the taxpayer, and balances that, as Regent has said earlier, with what do the students need, what do the patients need, and making sure that when I, when I advocate for access, flexibility, transparency, and accountability, that I'm representing the best interest of the taxpayers and the students and uh, the parents and trust to us. Because there are a lot of taxpayers to whom you're accountable that will never set foot on your campus. But they subsidize and so in your some student, way. Right. Your students and patients are a subset of taxpayers. Your taxpayers is a much larger subset. Mm -hmm. Thus, by virtue of your nomination by the governor as a statewide office holder and the confirmation that's pending before the Senate, 31 of us that represent the entire state, the entire state's your customer. Therefore, your, your duty is imposing the will of the people of Texas uh, on, uh, on the university system and being a good steward on their behalf. Um, so I very much appreciate your, your thoughts and sentiment to, in that regard. Um, the, uh, in contracting, one of the, again, that one state agency that's had a profound challenge that we're dealing with with the contract. Um, are there circumstances where a no-bid contract would be appropriate? If so, what would those be? Uh, otherwise, the second part of the question would be, uh, what diligence will you take as a member of the Board of Regents to ensure that any contracting that the university system or individual universities do uh, is transparent, open, <coughs> competitive, and gets the biggest bang for the least buck for the tax? <coughs> I'm fortunate that of late, um, all my positions have required um, earning, maintaining the public trust. So my organizations always do um, uh, RFPs, request for proposal, and then we use the leadership team pick the best. Certainly though, what the university does, what all the different components do is a lot more complicated <coughs> than the not-for-profits that I've supported. Um, in government though, I did have some fairly big. Um, there are some areas where there are organizations that hold patents. They're uniquely qualified to do work. Um, I would say that a hallmark of my service in, to the country and what I would bring to this is as long as there's transparency onto why it's being sole sourced or why it's no bid, then we don't put ourselves in a position of trouble. It's when we don't open it up to contracts and we aren't transparent that we're not we're not representing the taxpayers of Texas. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the earlier testimony with, with Regent Hicks, or the general tone of the questions that, uh, that I had taken dealt with the admissions. I won't go through all of those questions with you simply because uh, I think I've I got a good understanding. I think we know where we are in the current circumstances that uh, with what uh, the current Board of Regents are dealing with uh, in current circumstances. But I do want to discuss the firewall aspect. I know Chancellor um, Craven is uh, dealing with that right now, uh, or at least trying to get best recommendations. What would your recommendations be to the legislature for creating such a firewall to ensure that neither as a legislator nor a region or collection of legislatures or legislators or collection of regions uh, nor the chancellor uh, violating any right and wide threshold line that goes from normal policy function to a undue influence of favoritism, uh, how would you create that firewall to ensure that we regain public trust in that regard? I think as you look at building the protection of that firewall, you've got to look at it from at least three different um, dimensions. The first is ensuring that you don't crimp the ability um, of an administrator to use discretion in, in things that could be really valuable to an institution. You know, something that pops up, what if we're trying to recruit a terrific administrator, be it a provost or a, a dean, and they have current children at the campus where they reside, and we are trying to recruit them. We don't want to get in the way of that president of that institution being able to make that decision around adding that. We've had situations where we have back-to-back, -back, when I was undersecretary, we have back-to-back -back hurricanes in New Orleans. 
uh, or in Louisiana, a lot of kids were displaced that came to Texas and their families decided to stay here. Um, you know, these are transfer students, as it were, but you want to be able to give. So the first thing when you're constructing that firewall is what is legitimate in terms of discretionary use and how can we be transparent about it? The second thing I would say is we've got to make sure that we don't allow any undue influence. Um, I will tell you, I ran a scholarship organization and when young students, high school students would ask me, Mrs. Tucker, what is the thing you suggest in terms of letters of recommendation? I would have said to them, don't go to uh, officials because we tend to get form letters. Go find somebody that knows you well and can tell us why you would be meritorious of this. Um, uh, the second thing in constructing that firewall is just making sure that there are no penetration abilities for undue influence. There should be no undue influence in a public university. And then the last piece of it is when we have any kind of deviation from what is supposed to happen, how do we get transparency and accountability so that we're not surprised by anything we find out later? Well, if, if policy is violated, there's got to be a, a mechanism to ensure that those that have violated it have been held accountable to it uh, and publicly, because otherwise, again, it's your public trust that. That's the coin of the realm. I mean, that's just the coin of the realm. I mean, I, I don't mean to, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, and, and I was I thrilled just, when Chancellor McRae informed that Blue Ribbon Task Force, every one of those members is nationally networked, and I know that they're going to look at best practices at other institutions, and my hope is be that as they bring those best practices back to us, we'll understand how to construct that part of it. Let me, let me ask, uh, about a firewall that's more personal to you and the, 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 what's the best way for you to ensure that your fiduciary duty uh, to your current employer, the, the, your foundation, the math and science, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name now, but <laughs> National, Science, Math, National Math and Science Initiative, I'm sorry. Um, in your current duties there, how will you separate any interest you have in as CEO of that foundation um, from your duties as potentially a region in the, the state of Texas. Uh, how would you ensure that being a personal interest is either completely separated or clearly subordinate to the interest of the people of the state of Texas as a region? Um, a practice that has served me well in my public company boards um, there's always a relationship, but when I'm at a board meeting of Xerox as an example, and Sprint, which is one of my other corporate boards, is one of their five largest customers. When I'm in the Xerox boardroom, I'm responsible to the shareholder of Xerox. If a Sprint matter comes up, I recuse myself because it's not in the best interest of the Xerox shareholder for me to do anything with regard to that. I would view my responsibility to the taxpayer similar to my responsibility to shareholders. If I'm sitting in a board of regents meeting, any matter comes up where I might, whether it's a Xerox contract or a Sprint uh, plan on a campus, I would have to recuse myself because my best interest, for my serving the best interest of the taxpayer of Texas, is for me not to weigh in. In some way, you mentioned the CLA. I'm a board member of the Council for Right to Education, which created the CLA. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan, but I can't bring that, that concept in to, to my, because I've got to be objective to what the administration wants to do. Um. I'm watching you too, Senator Washington. So, um, um, I think I'll reserve comment. Yeah. The better part of discretion. But um, here's the uh, here's the part about the, the, the firewall. I'm, I'm beginning to, Mrs. Tucker, that while you recuse yourself in, in those matters is because you are in a being considered for an educational related duty here and your CEO <coughs> of an educational related uh, nonprofit, I assume it's nonprofit, I think, um, will you need a greater separation besides a recusal similar to what a president or vice president of the United States do in creating a blind trust? How do you provide a large demilitarized zone, so to speak, between those two functions, given they're both educational related. Um, so let me reassure you, there is no need for recusal because we do not work in higher education. 
all of our work is grades three through twelve in high schools across the United States. And, and let me and let me add a, a potential scenario to your your circumstance that uh, based upon all your work in higher education, we do have charter schools in the state of Texas, and the University of Texas uh, uh, university system colleges can establish charter schools, and they're not under the cap that we currently have for charter schools that uh, the that, that TEA certifies. So I would ask that question in the same vein. If the boards of regents decided that we're going to authorize charter schools by any of the, the uh, university uh, individual campuses within the UT system as a region, then how would you separate yourself? Uh, because now you've got a charter school that deals with K-12, how do you, again, I think the circumstances are, are, you'd have to answer that question similarly. Um, so let me explain just a little bit about how we fund um, the schools in which we work. The first thing, because we are a national for profit, we've got to find donors that are willing to invest money for us to come into schools, school districts. Donors tend to restrict their gifts to areas that are important to them. When we get the geography, and schools then, and we know we're going to pick schools, um, I'll make this up in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, then what we do is we hold webinars to all the schools in that area. They have to go through an application process to be selected. I have nothing to do with that. We have academics that look at those schools, the performance in those schools, test the administration's willingness to have open enrollment and rigorous curriculum. And this group of academics make the, makes the decision on which schools are selected that have been funded by donors. So the circumstance would have to be very unusual that a donor would have come to us and say, I only want to fund these types of schools, <laughs> in which case then the schools would have to go through that RFP pro process, submit a proposal to my academic team, and let the academic team decide. I really, other than fundraising and bringing resources to the organization, I am separate and distinct from the selection process. Um, one of the uh, um, one of the concerns about, uh, and I think in, in one of the senators brought it up in, in conversation with Regent Gibbs, uh, dealt with the forgivable loan program. And one of the concerns, when you particularly look at what happened at, at South Carolina, again, is another example, whether it was Illinois, South Carolina, and, and the like. Um, how would you address the perception of the favoritism surrounding the forgivable loan program, the deferred compensation, uh, faculty mortgage, programs at the UT Law School that, that reflect poorly, I think, on the, on the system. Should, should they be investigated to ensure that there is no illegality nor disparate impact to those faculty that were disfavored and not offered those options? Your thoughts? So, um, if I might, I don't have a lot of specifics about it, um, but the two things that I would say to you, um, I think taxpayers are advantaged when you're able to create an opportunity for the public funds to be supplemented by private funds, but you have to do it in a way that's transparent. And you have endowed well, chairs. Not just transparent, but lawful. Lawful. You have endowed chairs. You have um, endowed deanships. I know Stanford University most recently created endowments to cover the, the salaries of all of their athletic affairs uh, committees. Um, they're very public about that, and we report that. What I have learned about this is that there was no transparency, and that, that bothers me. Um, you have to you have to lawful and transparent. If you're going to have compensation, your compensation, particularly at a public institution, has to be transparent, and it has to be lawful, as you suggested. If we're going to marry private and public sector funds to, to be able to have more affordability for top talent, then let's do what it is. Let's call it what it is and endow it, or let's call it what it is and supplement it. But everybody needs to know what it is. Um, the, the the one area that uh, uh, in preparing for my time with you today, um, various media reports, and certainly Governor Abbott's comments, both that state of the state and the campaign time frame, dealt with common core. Mm -hmm. um, the my understanding is you're a proponent of, of common core. Is that, a, is that a correct assessment? 
No, that's not a correct assumption. Tell me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, tell me. I can be corrected. Senator Watson does it all the time. Yeah. Even though I'm not wrong when he corrects me. So. That would be one thing I'm not correct. <laughs> I applaud Common Core because I loved it, and I have to step back just a little bit. When I retired from my corporate life, I dedicated myself to higher education, and it was always about advancing higher education for disadvantaged students. Um, the more time I spent at the front lines of higher education, the more I realized that this country was never going to produce enough academically qualified high school graduates to meet the national needs. Um, I was a little surprised when I read about Common Core, and, and, and the two things that were impressive impressive to me. One, it came from the National Governors Association, a very independent group, and the Council of Chief State Officers, another independent group. They brought in um, international consultants that helped them create, in the, in the 2000 time frame, alignment across what's taught in the classroom, what's measured, and what works for the knowledge economy. To me, that, that's the first time that I've seen that we have that alignment. Too often, I've heard into more conversations where it's the blame game. Why aren't our graduation rates better? Well, you should see what we're getting from our high schools. Why aren't we doing better in high school? You should see what I get from middle schools. And I saw it as an opportunity. But I would tell you, I was thrilled when I saw that Texas, my home state, said, this is not for us. We're going to create our essential skills and knowledge uh, test. Conservative think tanks have looked at our TEKS results, and, and they only gave eight states an A or an A minus in, in English reading. Texas was one where they got an A minus. In math, we didn't fare as well. Six states got an A or an A minus, but that was before we redid our TEKS. And our TEKS um, has now, my understanding is, sixth graders this year, 60% of what they're taking is what seventh graders took last year. So I'm optimistic. But I run a national organization, and I've got 49 other states where I've got parents and students who are counting on rigorous standards, rigorous curriculum, and engaged teachers that are effective teachers. Um, as I look at national standards, states that have the lowest standards, the states that have the highest standards, there's a three to four grade deviation. Imagine you're a sixth grader, and in one place that's a second grade standard, and in another place it's a sixth grade standard. That's not fair. I, I wish more states were like my home state of Texas. Um, as I met with several of your colleagues, one of the things I said is, if, if I'm in a state and I'm looking at standards and I'm accountable to the taxpayers in that state, common is a reference point. It's a floor in my opinion. It's not a ceiling. I would wish states would do better. Look at those standards. See if they apply to your state. If they apply to your state, great. If they don't, then go do something to, to ensure that your students and your taxpayers um, are getting a public K-12 education that's going to deliver a high school graduates at STEM. My, my questions regarding Common Core are more about not specific to the, the tenets of it where we may disagree on them particular aspects or you know is it the right curriculum or not that's not what this discussion is my concern is more that as potentially based upon your foundation dealing with all 50 states recognizing for me the question isn't about the <coughs> curriculum per se for me the question is who commands the curriculum that Texas will use and that will be the State Board of Education the State Legislature and I wanted to make sure that knowing your relationship with your foundation and knowing the position of our governor and that the people of the state of Texas have overwhelmingly rejected Common Core, that unless either through whom they elect to the State Board of Education or the State Legislature, they will continue to reject that. My greater concern was your sense of discipline and subordination to the will of the governor based upon what he campaigned on, the will of the people of the state of Texas, as embodied in the governor and in the Senate, that whether it's your, in relationship to your foundation and its relationship to people in Texas or schools in Texas, uh, or as a region making sure that uh, Common Core is not something that will be advanced in either our schools of education and the respective uh, university system uh, individual campuses, I'm looking more for your spirit of subordination to the will of the people of Texas, uh, not a discussion of Common Core as it is, but as in who, just, who makes the decisions for the people of the state of Texas. So that's my sense, and I'd like you to address that. Sure. Three things that, that I'd like to say to that. First, 
Um, the Faculty Senate at every campus sets the curriculum at a college, and so I, I have no purview over that. There is no ability for me to influence um, that. The second thing um, that I would say to you is my organization advances greater results with advanced placement. When we come into a school, a school has already made that decision on whether to offer advanced placement and which advanced placement courses to offer. We support work in 11 different advanced placement, all in math, science, English literacy, and English literature. Um, we come in and work with teachers um, to help them effectively, more effectively um, teach those AP courses.